Bewitched by Edith Wharton The snow was still falling thickly when Aaron Bosworth, who farmed the land south of Lone Top, drove up in his cutter to Saul Routledge's gate. He was surprised to see two other cutters ahead of him. From them descended two muffled figures. Bosworth, with increasing surprise, recognized Deacon Hibben from North Ashmore and Sylvester Brand, the widower from the old Bearcliff farm on the way to Lone Top. It was not often that anybody in Hemlock County entered Saul Routledge's gate, least of all in the dead of winter, and summoned, as Bosworth at any rate had been, by Mrs. Routledge, who passed, even in that unsocial region, for a woman of cold manners and solitary character. The situation was enough to excite the curiosity of a less imaginative man than R. N. Bosworth. As he drove in between the broken-down white gateposts topped by fluted urns, the two men ahead of him were leading their horses to the adjoining shed. Bosworth followed and hitched his horse to a post. Then the three tossed off the snow from their shoulders, clapped their numb hands together, and greeted each other. Hello, Deacon. Very well, Aaron. They shook hands. Day, Bosworth, said Sylvester Brand with a brief nod. He seldom put any cordiality into his manner, and on this occasion he was still busy about his horse's bridle and blanket. Aaron Bosworth, the youngest and most communicative of the three, turned back to Deacon Hibben, whose long face, queerly blotched and moldy-looking, with blinking, peering eyes, was yet less forbidding than Bran's heavily hewn countenance. Queer are all meeting here up this way. Mrs. Routledge sent me a message to come. Bosworth volunteered. The deacon nodded. I got a word from her, too. Andy Pond came with it yesterday noon. I hope there's no trouble here. He glanced through the thickening fall of snow at the desolate front of the Routledge house, the more melancholy in its present neglected state, because, like the gateposts, it kept traces of former elegance. Bosworth had often wondered how such a house had come to be built in that lonely stretch between North Ashmore and Cold Corners. People said there had once been other houses like it, forming a little township called Ashmore, a sort of mountain colony created by the caprice of an English royalist officer, one Colonel Ashmore, who had been murdered by the Indians with all his family long before the Revolution. This tale was confirmed by the fact that the ruined cellars of several smaller houses were still to be discovered, under the wild growth of the adjoining slopes, and that the communion plate of the Moribund Episcopal Church of Cold Corners was engraved with the name of Colonel Ashmore, who had given it to the Church of Ashmore in the year 1723. Of the church itself, no traces remained. Doubtless it had been a modest wooden edifice built on piles, and the conflagration which had burnt the other houses to the ground's edge had reduced it utterly to ashes. The whole place, even in summer, wore a mournful, solitary air, and people wondered why Saul Routledge's father had gone there to settle. I never knew a place, Deacon Hibben said, that seemed as far away from humanity, and yet it ain't so in miles. Miles ain't the only distance, Aaron Bosworth answered, and the two men, followed by Sylvester Brand, walked across the drive to the front door. People in Hamlock County did not usually come and go by their front doors, but all three men seemed to feel that on an occasion which appeared to be so exceptional, the usual and more familiar approach by the kitchen would not be suitable. They had judged rightly. The deacon had hardly lifted the knocker when the door opened and Mrs. Routledge stood before them. Walk right in, she said in her usual dead level tone and Bosworth, as he followed the others, thought to himself, whatever's happened, she's not going to let it show in her face. It was doubtful, indeed, if anything unwanted could be made to show in Prudence Routledge's face, so limited was its scope, so fixed were its features. She was dressed for the occasion in black calico with white spots, a collar of crochet lace fastened by a gold brooch, and a gray woolen shawl crossed under her arms and tied at the back. In her small, narrow head, the only marked prominence was that of the brow projecting roundly over pale, spectacled eyes. Her dark hair parted above this prominence, passed tight and flat over the tips of her ears into a small braided coil at the nape, 
and her contracted head looked still narrower from being perched on a long, hollow neck with cord-like throat muscles. Her eyes were of a pale, cold gray. Her complexion was an even white. Her age might have been anywhere from thirty-five to sixty. The room into which she led the three men had probably been the dining room of the Ashmore house. It was now used as a front parlor, and a black stove planted on a sheet of zinc stuck out from the delicately fluted panels of an old wooden mantel. A newly lit fire smoldered reluctantly, and the room was at once close and bitterly cold. Andy Pond, Mrs. Rutledge cried to someone at the back of the house. Step out and call Mr. Rutledge. You'll likely find him in the woodshed or around the barn somewheres. She rejoined her visitors. Please, suit yourselves to seats, she said. The three men, with an increasing air of constraint, took the chairs she pointed out. A Mrs. Routledge sat stiffly down upon a fourth behind a rickety beadwork table. She glanced from one to the other of her visitors. I presume you folks are wondering what it is I asked you to come here for, she said in her dead level voice. Oren Bosworth and Deacon Hibben murmured in assent. Sylvester Brand sat silent, his eyes under their great thicket of eyebrows, fixed on the huge boot tip swinging before him. Well, I allow you didn't expect it was for a party, continued Mrs. Routledge. No one ventured to respond to this chill pleasantry, and she continued, We're in trouble here, and that's a fact, and we need advice, Mr. Routledge and myself do. She cleared her throat and added in a lower tone, her pitilessly clear eyes looking straight before her, There is a spell being cast over Mr. Routledge. The deacon looked up sharply, an incredulous smile pinching his thin lips. A spell. That's what I said. He's bewitched. And the three visitors were silent. Then Bosworth, more at ease or less tongue-tied than the others, asked with an attempt at humor, Do you use a word in the strict scripture sense, Mrs. Routledge? She glanced at him before replying, That's how he uses it. The deacon coughed and cleared his long, rattling throat. Do you care to give us more particulars before your husband joins us? Mrs. Routledge looked down at her clasped hands as if considering the question. Bosworth noticed that the inner fold of her lids was of the same uniform white as the rest of her skin, so that when she dropped them her rather prominent eyes looked like the sightless orbs of a marble statue. The impression was unpleasing, and he glanced away at the text over the mantelpiece which read, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. No, she said at length. I'll wait. At this moment, Sylvester Brand suddenly stood up and pushed back his chair. I don't know, he said in his rough bass voice, as I've got any particular lights on Bible mysteries, and this happens to be the day I was going to go down to Starkfield to close a deal with the man. Mrs. Routledge lifted one of her long, thin hands. Withered and wrinkled by hard work and cold, it was nevertheless of the same leaden white as her face. You won't be kept long, she said. Won't you be seated? Farmer Brand stood irresolute, his purplish underlip twitching. The deacon here, such things is more in his line. I want you should stay, said Mrs. Routledge quietly, and Brand sat down again. A silence fell, during which the four persons present seemed all to be listening for the sound of a step, but none was heard, and after a minute or two, Mrs. Routledge began to speak again. It's down by the little shack on Lamer's Pond. That's where they meet, she said suddenly. Bosworth, whose eyes were on Sylvester Brand's face, fancied he saw a sort of inner flush darken the farmer's heavy leather and skin. Deacon Hibben leaned forward, a glitter of curiosity in his eyes. They, who, Mrs. Routledge? My husband saw Routledge and her. Sylvester Brand again stirred in his seat. Who do you mean by her? he asked abruptly, as if roused out of some far-off musing. Mrs. Routledge's body did not move. She simply revolved her head on her long neck and looked at him. Your daughter, Sylvester Brand. The man staggered to his feet with an explosion of inarticulate sounds. My, my daughter? What the hell are you talking about? My daughter? It's a damn lie. It's, it's... Your daughter Aura, Mr. Brand said Mrs. Routledge slowly, 
Bosworth felt an icy chill down his spine. Instinctively, he turned his eyes away from Brand, and they rested on the mildewed countenance of Deacon Hibben. Between the blotches, it had become as white as Mrs. Routledge's, and the deacon's eyes burned in the whiteness like live embers among ashes. Brand gave a laugh, the rusty, creaking laugh of one whose springs of mirth are never moved by gaiety. My daughter Aura, he repeated. Yes, my dead daughter. That's what he says. Your husband. That's what Mr. Routledge says. Aaron Bosworth listened with a sense of suffocation. He felt as if he were wrestling with long-armed horrors in a dream. He could no longer resist letting his eyes return to Sylvester Brand's face. To his surprise, it had resumed a natural and perturbable expression. Brand rose to his feet. Is that all? he queried contemptuously. All? Ain't it enough? How long is it since you folks seen Saul Routledge, any of you? Mrs. Routledge flew out at them. Bosworth, it appeared, had not seen him for nearly a year. The deacon had only run across him once for a minute at the North Ashmore Post Office the previous autumn, and acknowledged that he wasn't looking any too good then. Bran said nothing, but stood irresolute. Well, if you wait a minute, you'll see with your own eyes, and he'll tell you with his own words. That's what I've got you here for, to see for yourselves what's come over him. Then you'll talk different, she added, twisting her head abruptly towards Sylvester Brand. The deacon raised a lean hand of interrogation. Does your husband know we've been sent for in this business, Mrs. Routledge? Mrs. Routledge signed assent. It was with his consent, then. She looked coldly at the questioner. I guess it had to be, she said. Again, Bosworth felt the chill down his spine. He tried to dissipate the sensation by speaking with an affectation of energy. Can you tell us, Mrs. Routledge, how this trouble you speak of shows itself? What makes you think? She looked at him for a moment, then she leaned forward across the rickety beadwork table. A thin smile of disdain narrowed her colorless lips. I don't think. I know. Well, but how? She leaned closer, both elbows on the table, her voice dropping. I seen him. In the ashen light from the veiling of snow beyond the windows, the deacon's little screwed-up eyes seemed to give out red sparks. Him and the dead. Him and the dead. Saul Routledge and, and, and Aura Brand? That's so. Sylvester Brand's chair fell backwards with a crash. He was on his feet again, crimson and cursing. It's a goddamn fiend-begotten lie. Friend Brand, friend Brand, the deacon protested. Here, let me get out of this. I want to see Saul Routledge himself and tell him. Well, here he is said Mrs. Routledge. The outer door had opened. They heard the familiar stamping and shaking of a man who rids his garments of their last snowflakes before penetrating to the sacred precincts of the best parlor. Then Saul Routledge entered. As he came in, he faced the light from the north window, and Bosworth's first thought was that he looked like a drowned man, fished out from under the ice. Self-drowned, he added. But the snow light plays cruel tricks with the man's color, and even with the shape of his features. It must have been partly that, Bosworth reflected, which transformed Saul Routledge from the straight, muscular fellow he had been a year before into the haggard wretch now before. The deacon sought for a word to ease the horror. Well now, Saul, you looks as if you'd ought to set right up to the stove. Had a touch of ague, you maybe? The feeble attempt was unavailing. Routledge neither moved nor answered. He stood among them silent, incommunicable, like one risen from the dead. Bran grasped him roughly by the shoulder. See here, Sal Routledge. What's this dirty lie your wife tells us you've been putting about? Still Routledge didn't move. It's no lie, he said. Bran's hand dropped from his shoulder. In spite of the man's rough bullying power, he seemed to be undefinably awed by Routledge's look and tone. No lie? You've gone plumb crazy then, have you? Mrs. Routledge spoke. My husband's not lying, nor he ain't gone crazy. Don't I tell you I seen him? Brand laughed again. Him and the dead? Yes. Down by the Lamer Pond, you say? Yes. And when was that, if I might ask? Day before yesterday. 
A silence fell on the strangely assembled group. The deacon at length broke it to say to Mr. Brand, Brand, in my opinion, we've got to see this thing through. Brand stood for a moment in speechless contemplation. There was something animal and primitive about him, Bosworth thought, as he hung thus, lowering and dim, a little foam beating on the corners of that heavy purplish underlip. He let himself slowly down to his chair. I'll see it through. The two other men and Mrs. Routledge had remained seated. Sal Routledge stood before them like a prisoner at the bar, or rather like a sick man before the physicians who were to heal him. As Bosworth scrutinized that hollow face, so wan under the dark sunburn, so sucked inward and consumed by some hidden fever, there stole over the sound healthy man the thought that perhaps, after all, husband and wife spoke the truth, and that they were all at that moment really standing on the edge of some forbidden mystery. Things that the rational mind would reject without a thought seemed no longer so easy to dispose of as one looked at the actual Sal Routledge and remembered the man he had been a year before. Yes, as the deacon said, they would have to see it through. Sit down then, Saul. Draw up to us, won't you? the deacon suggested, trying again for a natural tone. Mrs. Routledge pushed a chair forward and her husband sat down on it. He stretched out his arms and grasped his knees in his brown bony fingers. In that attitude he remained, turning neither his head nor his eyes. Well, Saul, the deacon continued, your wife says you thought maybe we could do something to help you through this trouble, whatever it is. Routledge's gray eyes widened a little. No, I didn't think that. It was her idea to try what could be done. I presume so, since you've agreed to our coming, that you don't object to our putting a few questions. Routledge was silent for a moment, then he said with a visible effort, No, I don't object. Well, you've heard what your wife says. Routledge made a slight motion of assent. And uh, what have you got to answer? How do you explain? Mrs. Routledge intervened. How can he explain? I seen him. There was a silence. Then Bosworth, trying to speak in an easy, reassuring tone, queried, That's so, Saul. That's so. Brand lifted up his brooding head. You mean to say, you sit here before us all and say, the deacon's hand again checked him. Hold on, friend Brand. We're all of us trying for the facts, ain't we? He turned to Routledge. We've heard what Mrs. Routledge says. What's your answer? I don't know as there is any answer. She found us. And you mean to tell me that the person you were with was what you took to be? The deacon's thin voice grew thinner. Aura Brand. Saul Routledge nodded. You knew, or thought you knew, you were meeting with the dead? Routledge bent his head again. The snow continued to fall in a steady and wavering sheet against the window, and Bosworth felt as if a winding sheet were descending from the sky to envelop them all in a common grave. Think what you're saying. It's against our religion, Aura. Poor child. Died over a year ago. I saw you at her funeral, Saul. So. How can you make such a statement? What else can he do, thrust in Mrs. Routledge? There was another pause. Bosworth's resources had failed him, and Brand once more sat plunged in dark meditation. The deacon laid his quivering fingertips together and moistened his lips. Was the day before yesterday the first time? he asked. The movement of Routledge's head was negative. Not the first. Then when... Nigh on a year ago, I reckon. God, and you mean to tell us it ever since? Well, look at him, said his wife. The three men lowered their eyes. After a moment, Bosworth, trying to collect himself, glanced at the deacon. Why not ask Saul to make his own statement, if that's what we're here for? That's so, the deacon assented. He turned to Routledge. Will you try and give us your idea of, uh, of how it began? There was another silence. Then Routledge tightened his grasp on his gaunt knees, and still looking straight ahead with his curiously clear and seeing gaze. Well, he said, I guess it begun a way back, before even I was married to Mrs. Routledge. He spoke in a low, automatic tone, as if some invisible agent were dictating his words or even uttering them for him. You know, he added, R and me was to have been married. Sylvester Brand lifted his head. 
straighten that statement out first, please, he interjected. What I mean is, we kept company, but Aura, she was very young. Mr. Brand here, he sent her away. She was gone nigh to three years, I guess. Uh, when she come back, I was married. That's right, Brand said, relapsing once more into his sunken attitude. And after she came back, uh, did you meet her again? The deacon continued. Alive? Routledge questioned. A perceptible shudder ran through the room. Well, of course, said the deacon nervously. Routledge seemed to consider. Once I did. Only once. There was a lot of other people round at Cold Corners Fair it was. Did you talk with her then? Only a minute. What did she say? His voice dropped. She said she was sick and knew she was going to die. And when she was dead, she'd come back to me. And what did you answer? Nothing. Did you think anything of it at the time? Well, no. Not till I heard she was dead, I didn't. After that, I thought of it. And I guess she drew me. He moistened his lips. Drew you down to that abandoned house by the pond? Routledge made a faint motion of assent, and the deacon added, How did you know it was there she wanted you to come? She just drew me. There was a long pause. Bosworth felt on himself and the other two men the oppressive weight of the next question to be asked. Mrs. Routledge opened and closed her narrow lips once or twice like some beach shellfish gasping for the tide. Routledge waited. Well now, Saul, won't you go on with what you was telling us, the deacon at length suggested. That's all. There's nothing else. The deacon lowered his voice. She just draws you. Yes. Often. That's as it happens. But if it's always there she draws you, man, haven't you the strength to keep away from the place? For the first time, Routledge wearily turned his head towards his questioner. A spectral smile narrowed his colorless lips. Ain't any use. She follows after me. There was another silence. What more could they ask then and there? Mrs. Routledge's presence checked the next question. The deacon seemed hopelessly to revolve the matter. At length he spoke in a more authoritative tone. These are forbidden things. You know that, Saul. Have you tried prayer? Routledge shook his head. Will you pray with us now? Routledge cast a glance of freezing indifference on his spiritual advisor. If you folks want to pray, I'm agreeable, he said. But Mrs. Routledge intervened. Prayer ain't no good. In this kind of thing, it ain't no matter of use. You know it ain't. I called you here, Deacon, because you remember the last case in this parish. Thirty years ago it was, I guess, but you remember. Lefferts Nash did pray and help him. I was a little girl then, but I used to hear my folks talk of it winter nights. Lefferts Nash and Hannah Corey. They drove a stake through her breast. That's what cured him. Oh, Aaron Bosworth exclaimed. Sylvester Brand raised his head. Speaking of that old story as if this was the same sort of thing. Ain't it? Ain't my husband pining the way the same as Lefferts Nash did? The deacon here knows. The deacon stirred anxiously in his chair. These are forbidden things, he repeated. Supposing your husband is quite sincere in thinking himself haunted, as you might say. Well, even then, what proof have we that the, the, the dead woman is a specter of that poor girl? Proof? Don't he say so? Didn't she tell him? Ain't I seen him? Mrs. Routledge almost screamed. The three men sat silent, and suddenly the wife burst out. A stake through the breast. That's the old way, and it's the only way. The deacon knows it. It's against our religion to disturb the dead. Ain't it against your religion to let the living perish as my husband is perishing? She sprang up with one of her abrupt movements and took the family Bible from the whatnot in the corner of the parlor. Putting the book on the table, she moistened the livid fingertip. She turned the pages rapidly till she came to one which she laid her hand on like a stony paperweight. See here, she said, and read out in her level, chanting voice, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. That's in Exodus, that's where it is, she added, leaving the book open, as if to confirm the statement. Bosworth continued to glance anxiously from one to the other of the four people about the table. He was younger than any of them, and had had more contact with the modern world down in Starkfield in the bar of the Fielding House. He could hear himself laughing with the rest of the men at such old wives' tales. 
But it was not for nothing that he had been born under the icy shadow of Lone Top and had shivered and hungered as a lad through the bitter Hemlock County winters. After his parents died, and he had taken hold of the farm himself, he had got more out of it by using improved methods and by supplying the increasing throng of summer boarders over Stotesbury Way with milk and vegetables. He had been made a select man of North Ashmore, for so young a man he had standing in the county. But the roots of the old life were still in him. He could remember as a little boy going twice a year with his mother to that bleak hill farm out beyond Sylvester Brands, where Mrs. Bosworth's aunt, Cressidora Cheney, had been shut up for years in a cold, clean room with iron bars in the windows. When little Orrin first saw Aunt Cressidora, she was a small, white old woman whom her sisters used to make decent for visitors the day that Aaron and his mother were expected. The child wondered why there were bars on the window. Like a canary bird, he said to his mother. The phrase made Mrs. Bosworth reflect. I do believe they keep Aunt Cressidora too lonesome, she said. And the next time she went up to the mountain with the little boy, he carried to his great aunt a canary in a little wooden cage. It was a great excitement. He knew it would make her happy. The old woman's motionless face lit up when she saw the bird, and her eyes began to glitter. It belongs to me, she said instantly, stretching her soft, bony hand over the cage. Of course it does, Aunt Cressy, said Mrs. Bosworth, her eyes filling. But the bird, startled by the shadow of the old woman's hand, began to flutter and beat its wings distractedly. At the sight, Aunt Cressidora's calm face suddenly became a coil of twitching features. You she double you! she cried in a high squealing voice, and thrusting her hand into the cage, she dragged out the terrified bird and wrung its neck. She was plucking the hot body and squealing, She devil, she devil, as they drew little Orin from the room. On the way down the mountain, his mother wept a great deal and said, You must never tell anybody that poor Auntie's crazy, or the men would come and take her down to the asylum at Starkfield, and the shame of it would kill us all. Now promise. The child promised. He remembered the scene now with its deep fringe of mystery, secrecy, and rumor. It seemed related to a great many other things below the surface of his thoughts, things which stole up anew, making him feel that all the old people he had known and who believed in these things might after all be right. Hadn't the witch been burned at North Ashmore? Didn't the summer folk still drive over in jolly buckbird loads to see the meeting house where the trial had been held, the pond where they had ducked her and she had floated? Deacon Hibben believed. Bosworth was sure of it. If he didn't, why did people from all over the place come to him when their animals had queer sicknesses, or when there was a child in the family that had to be kept shut up because it fell down flat and foamed? Yes, in spite of his religion, Deacon Hibben knew. And Brand? Well, it came to Bosworth in a flash. That North Ashmore woman who was burned had the name of Brand. The same stock, no doubt. There had been brands in Hemlock County ever since the white men had come there, and Orrin, when he was a child, remembered hearing his parents say that Sylvester Brand hadn't ever ought to have married his own cousin because of the blood. Yet the couple had had two healthy girls, and when Mrs. Brand pined away and died, nobody suggested that anything had been wrong with her mind. And Vanessa and Aura were the handsomest girls anywhere around. Brand knew it and scrimped and saved all he could to send Aura, the eldest, down to Starkfield to learn bookkeeping. When she's married, I'll send you, he used to say to little Venny, who was his favorite. But Aura never married. She was away three years, during which Venny ran wild on the slopes of Lone Top, and when Aura came back, she sickened and died, poor girl. Since then, Brand had grown more savage and morose. He was a hard-working farmer, but there wasn't much to be got out of those barren Bearcliff acres. He was said to have taken the drink since his wife's death. Now and then men ran across him in the dives of Stotesbury, but not often. And between times he labored hard on his stony acres and did his best for his daughters. In the neglected graveyard of Cold Corners there was a slanting headstone marked with his wife's name. Near it, a year since, he had laid his eldest daughter and sometimes at dusk in the autumn the village people saw him walk slowly by turn in between the graves and stand looking down on the two stones. But he never brought a flower there or planted a bush, nor Venny either. She was too wild and ignorant. 
Mrs. Routledge repeated. That's in Exodus. The three visitors remained silent, turning about their hats and reluctant hands. Routledge faced them still with that empty, pellucid gaze which frightened Bosworth. What was he seeing? Ain't any of you folks got the grit? His wife burst out again, half hysterically. Deacon Hibben held up his hand. That's no way, Mrs. Routledge. This ain't a question of having grit. What we want, first of all, is proof. That's so, said Bosworth, with an explosion of relief, as if the words had lifted something black and crouching from his breast. Involuntarily, the eyes of both men had turned to Brand. He stood there, smiling grimly, but did not speak. Ain't it so, Brand? The deacon prompted him. Proof that spooks walk? The other sneered. Well, I presume you want this business settled, too. The old farmer squared his shoulders. Yes, I do. But I ain't a spiritualist. How the hell are you gonna settle it? Deacon Hibben hesitated, then he said in a low, incisive tone, I don't see but one way, Mrs. Routledge's. There was a silence. What? Brand sneered again. Spying? The deacon's voice sank lower. If the poor girl does walk, her, that's your child, wouldn't you be the first to want to lay quiet? We all know there have been such cases, mysterious visitations. Can any one of us here deny it? I seen them, Mrs. Routledge interjected. There was another heavy pause. Suddenly, Brand fixed his gaze on Routledge. See here, Saul Routledge. You've got to clear up this damn calumny, or you'll know why. You say my dead girl comes to you, he labored with his breath and then jerked out. When? You tell me that, and I'll be there. Routledge's head drooped a little and his eyes wandered to the window. Round about sunset, mostly. You know beforehand? Routledge made a sign of assent. Well, then. Tomorrow will it be? Routledge made the same sign. Bran turned to the door. I'll be there. That was all he said. He strode out between them without another glance or word. Deacon Hibben looked at Mrs. Routledge. We'll be there too, he said, as if she had asked him, but she had not spoken. And Bosworth saw her thin body was trembling all over. He was glad when he and Hibben were out again in the snow. And to give him time to unhitch his horse, they made a pretense of hanging about in the doorway while Bosworth searched his pockets for a pipe. He had no mind to light. But Bran turned back to them as he lingered. You'll meet me down by Lamer's Pond tomorrow, he suggested. I want witnesses. Round about sunset. They nodded their acquiescence and he got into his sleigh, gave the horse a cut across the flanks and drove off under the snow-smothered hemlocks. The other two men went to the shed. What do you make of this business, Deacon? Bosworth asked to break the silence. The deacon shook his head. The man's a sick man, that's sure. Something sucking the life clean out of him. But already in the biting outer air, Bosworth was getting himself under better control. That ah, looks to me like a bad case of the ague, as you said. Well, ague of the mind, then. It's his brain that's sick. Bosworth shrugged. He ain't the first in Hemlock County. That's so, the deacon agreed. It's a worm in the brain, solitude is. Well, we'll know this time tomorrow, maybe, said Bosworth. He scrambled into his sleigh and was driving off in his turn when he heard his companion calling after him. The deacon explained that his horse had cast a shoe. Would Bosworth drive him down to the forge near North Ashmore if it wasn't too much out of his way? He didn't want the mare slipping about on the freezing snow, and he could probably get the blacksmith to drive him back and shoe her in Routledge's shed. Bosworth made room for him under the bearskin, and the two men drove off, pursued by a puzzled whinny from the deacon's old mare. The road they took was not the one that Bosworth would have followed to reach his own home, but he didn't mind that. The shortest way to the forge passed close by Lamer's Pond, and Bosworth, since he was in for the business, was not sorry to look the ground over. They drove on in silence. The snow had ceased, and a green sunset was spreading upward into the crystal sky. A stinging wind barbed with ice flakes caught them in the face on the open ridges, but when they dropped down into the hollow by Lamer's Pond, the air was soundless and empty as an unswung bell. They jogged along slowly, each thinking his own thoughts. That's the house, the tumble-down shack over there, I suppose, the deacon said, as the road drew near the edge of the frozen pond. Yes, that's the house, a queer hermit fellow built it years ago, my father used to tell me, 
Since then, I don't believe he's ever been used but by the gypsies. Bosworth had reined in his horse and sat looking to the pine trunks purpled by the sunset at the crumbling structure. Twilight already lay under the trees, though day lingered in the open. Between two sharply patterned pine boughs he saw the evening star, like a white boat in a sea of green. His gaze had dropped from that fathomless sky and followed the blue-white undulations of the snow. It gave him a curious, agitated feeling to think that here, in this icy solitude, in the tumble-down house he had so often passed without heeding it, a dark mystery, too deep for thought, was being enacted. Down that very slope, coming from the graveyard at cold corners, the being they called Aura must pass toward the pond. His heart began to beat stiflingly. Suddenly he gave an exclamation. Look! He had jumped out of the cutter and was stumbling up the bank toward the slope of snow. On it, turned in the direction of the house by the pond, he had detected a woman's footprints, two, then three, then more. The deacon scrambled out after him and they stood and stared. God, barefoot, Hibben gasped. Then it is the dead. Bosworth said nothing, but he knew that no live woman would travel with naked feet across that freezing wilderness. Here, then, was the proof the deacon had asked for. They held it. What should he do with it? Supposing we was to drive up nearer, round the turn of the pond, till we get close to the house, the deacon proposed in a colorless voice. Maybe then. Postponement was a relief. They got into the sleigh and drove on. Two or three hundred yards further down the road, a mere lane under the steep bushy banks, turned sharply to the right, following the bend of the pond. As they rounded the turn, they saw Brands cut her ahead of them. It was empty, the horse tied to a tree trunk. The two men looked at each other again. This was not Brand's nearest way home. Evidently, he had been actuated by the same impulse which had made them rein in their horse by the pond side and then hasten on to the deserted hovel. Had he, too, discovered those spectral footprints? Perhaps it was for that very reason that he had left his cutter and vanished in the direction of the house. Bosworth found himself shivering all over under his bearskin. I wish to God the dark wasn't coming on, he muttered. He tethered his own horse near Brand's, and without a word, he and the deacon plowed through the snow and the track of Brand's huge feet. They had only a few yards to walk to overtake him. He didn't hear them following him, and when Bosworth spoke his name and he stopped short and turned, his heavy face was dim and confused, like a darker blot on the dusk. He looked at them dully, but without surprise. I wanted to see the place, he merely said. The deacon cleared his throat. Just take a look. Yes, we thought so, but I guess there won't be anything to see, he attempted a chuckle. The other did not seem to hear him, but labored on, ahead through the pines. The three men came out together in the cleared space before the house. As they emerged from beneath the trees, they seemed to have left night behind. The evening star shed a luster on the speckless snow, and Brand, in that lucid circle, stopped with a jerk and pointed to the same light footprints turned towards the house the track of a woman in the snow. He stood still, his face working. Bare feet, he said. The deacon piped up in a quavering voice. The feet of the dead. Brand remained motionless. The feet of the dead, he echoed. Deacon Hibben laid a frightened hand on his arm. Come away now, Brand, for the love of God, come away. The father hung there, gazing down at those light tracks on the snow. Light as a fox or squirrel trails, he seemed, on the white immensity. Bosworth thought to himself, the living couldn't walk so light. Not even Aura Brand couldn't have when she lived. The cold seemed to have entered into his very marrow. His teeth were chattering. Brand swung about on them abruptly. Now, he said, moving on as if to an assault, his head bowed forward on his bull neck. Now, now, not in there, gasped the deacon. What's the use? It was tomorrow, he said. He shook like a leaf. It's now, said Brand. He went up to the door of the crazy house, pushed it inward, and meeting with an unexpected resistance, thrust his heavy shoulder against the panel. The door collapsed like a playing card, and Brand stumbled after it into the darkness of the hut. The others, after a moment's hesitation, followed. Bosworth was never quite sure in what order the events that succeeded took place. Coming in out of the snow dazzle, 
He seemed to be plunging into total blackness. He groped his way across the threshold, caught a sharp splinter of the fallen door in his palm, seemed to see something white and wraith-like surge up out of the darkest corner of the hut, and then heard a revolver shot at his elbow and a cry. Brand had turned back and was staggering past him out into the lingering daylight. The sunset suddenly flushing through the trees crimsoned his face like blood. He held a revolver in his hand and looked about him in his stupid way. They do walk then, he said, and began to laugh. He bent his head to examine his weapon. Better here than in the churchyard. They shan't dig her up now, he shouted out. The two men caught him by the arms, and Bosworth got the revolver away from him. The next day, Bosworth's sister Loretta, who kept house for him, asked him when he came in for his midday dinner if he had heard the news. Bosworth had been sawing wood all the morning, and in spite of the cold and driving snow which had begun again in the night, he was covered in an icy sweat, like a man getting over a fever. What news? Venny Brand's down sick with pneumonia. The deacon's been there. I guess she's dying. Bosworth looked at her with listless eyes. She seemed far off from him, miles away. Fanny Brand, he echoed. You never liked her, Orin. She's a child. I never knew much about her. Well, repeated his sister with the guileless relish of the unimaginative for bad news, I guess she's dying. After pause, she added, It'll kill Sylvester Brand all alone up there. Bosworth got up and said, I've got to see to policing the Grace Fetlock. He walked out into the steadily falling snow. Venny Brand was buried three days later. The deacon read the service. Bosworth was one of the pallbearers. The whole countryside turned out, for the snow had stopped falling, and at any season the funeral offered an opportunity for an outing that was not to be missed. Besides, Venny Brand was young and handsome. At least some people thought her handsome, though she was so swarthy and her dying like that so suddenly had the fascination of tragedy. They say her lungs filled right up. Seems she'd had a bronchial trouble before. I always said both them girls was frail. Look at Aura, how she took and wasted away. And it's colder all outdoors up there to Brands. Their mother, too, she pined away just the same. They don't ever make old bones on the mother's side of the family. That's that young Bedlow over there, and they say Venny was engaged to him. Oh, Mrs. Routledge, excuse me. Step right into the pew. There's a seat for you alongside a grandma. Mrs. Routledge was advancing with deliberate steps down the narrow aisle of the bleak wooden church. She had on her best bonnet and monumental structure, which no one had seen out of her trunks since old Mrs. Silsey's funeral three years before. All the women remembered it. Under its perpendicular pile, her narrow face, swaying on the long, thin neck, seemed whiter than ever. But her air of fretfulness had been composed into a suitable expression of mournful immobility. Looks as if the stonemason had carved her to put atop of Venny's grave, Bosworth thought, as she glided past him, and then shivered at his own sepulchral fancy. When she bent over her hymn book, her lowered lids reminded him again of marble eyeballs. The bony hands clasping the book were bloodless. Bosworth had never seen such hands since he had seen old Anne Cressidora Cheney strangle a canary bird because it fluttered. The service was over, the coffin of Venny Brand had been lowered into her sister's grave, and the neighbors were slowly dispersing. Bosworth, as pallbearer, felt obliged to linger and say a word to the stricken father. He waited till Brand had turned from the grave with the deacon at his side. The three men stood together for a moment, but none of them spoke. Brand's face was the closed door of a vault, barred with wrinkles like bands of iron. Finally, the deacon took his hand and said, The Lord gave. Bran nodded and turned away toward the shed where the horses were hitched. Boswell followed him. Let me drive along home with you, he suggested. Bran did not so much as turn his head. Home. What home, he said, and the other fell back. Loretta Bosworth was talking with the other women while the men unblanketed their horses and backed the cutters out into the heavy snow. As Bosworth waited for her, a few feet off, he saw Mrs. Routledge's tall bonnet lording it above the group. Andy Pond, the Routledge farmhand, was backing out the sleigh. Saul ain't here today, Mrs. Routledge, is he? One of the village elders piped, turning a benevolent old tortoise head about on a loose neck and blinking up into Mrs. Routledge's marble face. Bosworth heard her measure out her answer in slow, incisive words. 
No, Mr. Routledge, he ain't here. He would have come for certain, but his Aunt Menorca Cummins has been buried down to Stokesbury this very day, and he had to go down there. Don't it sometimes seem as if we was all walking right in the shadow of death? As she walked towards the cutter in which Andy Pond was already seated, the deacon went up to her with visible hesitation. Involuntarily, Bosworth also moved nearer. He heard the deacon say, I'm glad to hear that Saul is able to be up and around. She turned her small head on her rigid neck and lifted the lids of marble. Yes, I guess he'll sleep quieter now. And her too, maybe, now she don't lay there alone any longer. She added in a low voice with a sudden twist of her chin toward the fresh black stain in the graveyard snow. She got into the cutter and said in a clear tone to Andy Pond, As long as we're down here, I don't know but what I'll just call round and get a box of soap at Hiram Pringles. Edith Wharton was born Edith Jones in New York in 1862. She actually lived till she was 75 and died in Paris, in France. She was a very famous American novelist of her time, and she actually won the Pulitzer Prize for one of her books, uh, The Age of Innocence, which I remember was a lovely film uh, with Michelle Pfeiffer in, I think. Uh, quite old now, the film. The book's even older. Um, so, she, she, as I say, she was a debutante and a socialite, and also I think she's a very good writer. So... This story, what's really nice about reading stories by excellent writers is they just, you just get into them. You just get into the characters and the dialogue. So this is, um, much as I love some of the other stories I'm going to be reading, this, you can tell that Edith Wharton is a real craftswoman. The first scene in particular where um, she has the guys, it's all very black and white, very stark. It's like, uh, you know, some Bergman film or some Norwegian um expressionist movie because the, here they are coming in black black trees white snow three dour unspeaking generally men um who gather in the parlor and there's this uh, very sharp woman who tells them this unbelievable story but the way she builds it up and the way she cr creates questions what on earth are they doing there what's it for is it true and then the first scene ends with uh, Saul Routledge coming in shaking the snow off him out of sight so we hear him mentally before we see him you know uh, i think it's really fantastic i'm not actually sure whether this is in fact a, a ghost story um because it crossed my mind at the end when the daughter dies venny dies did she die because she was shot by her father was she the one that Saul Ratwitz was meeting? But then there are other things, other hints that make it clear that as far as most of the people there are concerned, it was a real story of someone returning from the dead. Um, I've got things to say about ghost stories elsewhere, but, you know, they're usually very moral tales. Somebody's being punished for a sin in the, light, the lighter ones that have a happy ending almost. Uh, somebody gets rewarded for doing something good, you know. They're very moral. They're all about how we should behave and. Uh, how the dead will punish us if we don't. Um, the other thing to say is these themes of a remote rural countryside with ancient primitive beliefs um, that are hidden, forbidden things, I think the deacon says, um, is very reminiscent of the whole folk horror thing. I think the new movie that was out this year, Midsommar, Midsommar um, set in Sweden, was very much that. Because the the Wicker Man, the classic folk horror story of the nineteen seventies, but indeed, yeah, absolutely, this folk horror thing that's that's running through with old folklore. And Lovecraft himself was wasn't above using that. A lot of his New England, well, this is Lovecraft's New England almost, although probably better written. I'm sorry to say, although I do love Lovecraft's completely over the top prose. Everything squames blasphemy. Um, I do like that, but, um, you know, Edith Wharton can write. So that's that. I hope you liked it. I'm going to do another story next week. Um, I'm in two minds. I, I really want to do Sheridan Lafanu's 
Carmilla. I'd love to do Dracula, but that's too long. Sheridan Le Fanu's um, Carmilla, which might need to be broken down into episodes. Either that or a first appearance by good old HP himself. I might do Dagon. Um, hey, the world is my oyster. Let me know if you, if you have any preferences or any requests. Um, I'm abs- I'd be absolutely delighted to, if you could uh, just let me know. Let me know. I'd be very, very grateful to have the feedback. So I'm going to, in the notes for the podcast, I'm going to introduce, not introduce, I'm going to um, put a link in for my book, my recent book, the one that's just out, which is Cumbrian Ghost Stories. Probably most of you don't even know where Cumbria is. But never mind. It's one of those remote rural places with primitive customs we were just talking about. Um, and then there's Patreon, Patreon, Patreon. Um, you know, wouldn't it be great if I didn't have to work and I could just do this all the time, write and read stories? Wow. Well, this is possible with your help. Uh, it may it may take a little while, but let's be ambitious. So if you felt like you, you like me doing this and you want more, uh, then uh, a Patreon subscription would be very handy. You don't have to put very much into it. Um, at the moment, yeah, anyway, okay. I don't want to plug it too much. Whatever happens, I will read again. Okay, see you next week. <laughs>